Uh, this is Dwayne Friend, and I uh, want to welcome everybody to uh, this session of our Four Seasons um, Gardening Webinar Series. My name is Dwayne Friend, and I'm going to be talking a little bit tonight about composting, how to make your compost the best that it can be by trying to do a little bit of recipe making with it. Now, we do have a relatively small group with us tonight, but uh, what I'm going to ask is that if you do have questions, just kind of jot them down on some notes, and we will uh, then go to, um, uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have time. If you want to put those in the chat box, or if you want to unmute your mic at that point and ask the questions, we'll do it then. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started with this. And the first thing that we want to talk about is what we really want to do with that compost. Now, it is a great way of recycling organic material, uh, but really, what do you want to do with that end product? Uh, and if you want a really high quality type of compost, you're going to have to manage it. Now, nature will go out and do its own thing, but if you want a really high quality material, you're going to have to manage that process to make it the best that it can be. And if you're going to do that, you might as well start doing that at the very beginning of that composting process. Now, when we think about what can go wrong with a compost, there are several things that can happen with that. Now, first of all, when we're talking about the composting process in this case, and we're not talking about uh, using earthworms or doing vermicomposting, we're talking about aerobic composting. And what aerobic means is that that compost needs oxygen for the microbes that are in that compost to decompose that organic material. Those are very efficient at doing that. Now, if there are not enough of those aerobic bacteria available, nature has a backup plan. There's another type of bacteria that will start breaking down that material. They're called anaerobic bacteria. They don't need the oxygen, but unfortunately, as they do their thing, they give off some pretty disgusting odors, things like putrescine, cadaverin, um, just very nasty odors. So uh, if you don't have enough oxygen in that compost, uh, you, you definitely will have odor problems just because of that reason. Some other issues that'll come into play, if you don't have the right mix of materials, uh, that co whole composting process is not gonna be very efficient and it's gonna be very slow. And, um, you know, if you're wanting a product relatively quickly, and we'll talk about how long you have to, to think about in terms of that in here in just a little bit, but um, that compost can be very slow or almost non-existent if you have a bad mix. Also, if you don't have the right mix of materials, uh, one of the things with aerobic composting is that when it is going properly, Temperatures within that compost pile are going to be pretty high. They can be anywhere from about 125 up to about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you don't have that right mix, you're not going to get those temperatures up. And again, you're not going to have very fast composting. And if all of these things take place and then you realize that you really don't have uh, the right type of material to, to do what's needed to be done, then you're probably going to have to tear all of that apart and start over again. So you've just wasted a bunch of time uh, where if, you'd have, if you would have had the right mix at the start, things would have been going along pretty nicely. Some of the challenges with that, though, uh, let's say we're talking about fall and you've got a ton of leaves that have fallen off your yard. Well, that's, that's one material, but you're probably going to need, in most cases, several different types of material. And... Will that other type of material be available? That's one of the challenges that you have to think about when you are composting. Uh, time of year comes into play. Now, you can start a compost pile any time of the year. But when our uh, outdoor temperatures uh, start getting lower, uh, especially when they start getting below 50, uh, things start slowing down, and uh, especially in the winter time, uh, when things get below freezing for an extended period of time, most of that compost shuts down during those really cold times of the year. Now, that'll start back up in the springtime, but um, you know, if you do have a bunch of material, you can put it together. It's just not going to compost very much during the wintertime simply because of temperatures. And even if you do have what you appears to be the right mix of feedstocks or materials, 
uh, there can be variation in those materials. For example, um, I use the example of uh, grass clippings. There's a big difference between fresh green grass clippings and those same grass clippings that have been sitting around for maybe a month. So there can be variation even in the same type of feedstock and uh, that can change the mix also. That final product quality, what I talked about at the very beginning, if you want a good quality product, uh, having that recipe that, that gets you into that ideal realm uh, will give you, help give you that good final product. Uh, it's also going to help speed up that rate of decomposition and you're going to have those aerobic uh, composting temperatures that you know will help speed up the composting process. So there's um, three things that, that go into making compost materials good. One of them is going to be the chemical makeup of the raw ingredients. Now particularly what we're going to be talking about with that is the amount of carbon and the amount of nitrogen in organic material. And when we're composting, all we're doing really is just managing what nature would be doing naturally. Uh, and we're, we're trying to uh, get that organic material to a stable form that then we can use as a mulch, as a soil amendment, potting mix, those types of things. And that organic material uh, needs to be broken down into uh, more stable products to, to do that. And every, every organic bit of organic material has carbon and nitrogen in it. So uh, the amount of carbon and nitrogen can vary greatly, which we'll show here in just a little bit. When we talk about the physical size and shape of a compost pile, that comes into play with airflow and um, how well those bacteria can get at that organic material. Uh, for example, uh, in the physical size and shape, um, the physical size itself, we, we usually say you have to have a critical mass for that composting process to get going. So typically, we're talking about a minimum of a cubic yard. So in other words, three feet by three feet by three feet. If you get it smaller than that, you're really not going to have good composting taking place. Now, as far as the shape, um, that can, that can vary somewhat depending on if you have a holding bin or something like that. Um, but <clears throat> also if you have certain types of material, that nice kind of pyramidal shape that you might want to have may not be possible if you have a lot of really loose material that won't allow that to happen. In terms of porosity, we, we have to go with a me happy medium for this. So we want particles small enough that the aerobic bacteria can get to and decompose. On the other hand, you don't want the material so small that it's not going to allow airflow to get through it. So you're going to have to have kind of a, a happy medium with those types of things. And then in terms of the population of organisms, again, we're talking during active composting, we're talking about those aerobic bacteria. And what's causing the temperature increase in that compost is simply the metabolism of all those bacteria that are decomposing that organic matter. So the more of those organisms you have, the warmer that compost pile is going to be. And getting into the composting process, now some of you may have seen this before, but it's a, just a basic diagram of what we're doing with this. And I just use a general term yard trimmings, but really any type of organic material can be composted. Some of them work better than others. But the microorganisms, the main microorganisms that we're talking about are the aerobic bacteria. Other organisms are really not going to be present during active composting because of those higher temperatures. So you're not going to have things like earthworms or springtails or anything like that or fungi in an active compost pile. Now those populations may build up when that compost is getting pretty close to a finished product, but during active composting, it's going to be the bacteria that's doing the work. They need oxygen to function. They need water to function. As they're breaking that organic material down, that the yard trimmings or whatever it is you're using, uh, it's going to have some byproducts. You're going to have some of that water driven off as water vapor. Again, the metabolism of those bacteria are generating heat. Some of the carbon 
from that organic material is going to be driven off as carbon dioxide. And then the byproduct that we're seeking, and sometimes this uh, is used in a very general term, which it is in this case, is humus. Humus is a very stable form of organic matter. And we're kind of using it very generally here in this case. Uh, the, the finished product in compost is probably not quite to that humified level yet, but it, uh, it's much closer than it would be when it was fresh. So that's what we're, what we're trying to get to. Why do we use those organic materials and why do the uh, organisms uh, like that? Because it has the things that those bacteria need. It uses the carbon for energy. It uses the nitrogen to build their bodies, to build those cell walls. Lots of different types of carbon, though, in organic materials. Some of them are very, very easily decomposed, you know, the simple carbohydrates, hemicellulose. But as we go down through the list, those things like the cellulose, the chitin, the lignin, get harder and harder to decompose. They take longer to do it. And uh, some of those, especially the, the lignin products, may take very long periods of time to break down. On the nitrogen side, what that nitrogen is doing is, again, it's supplying for those bacteria amino acids that they need, the proteins that they need to build the cell walls. And where you're going to get that material is, or high nitrogen amounts of, of material are going to be in fresh plant tissue. So like fresh vegetable waste, fresh um, fruit waste, uh, green leaves, green grass, manure, uh, legume hay, all of those things are good sources of nitrogen. What we're trying to do when we're trying to get the right mix of materials is we're trying to get on average a carbon nitrogen ratio somewhere around 25 to 1 to 30 to 1, somewhere in that range. If you get close to that with the right mixed materials, you can see that the compost temperature can get very high. And again, the higher it is, the more active the composting that's taking place. So what we're trying to do is get that mixed materials that's going to get us as close as possible to that 25 to 1 ratio or the, to the 30 to 1 ratio, somewhere in that range. Now, there's other things we have to consider, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit, but that's one of the main goals with recipe making. So what kind of carbon nitrogen ratios do different types of organic materials have? Well, this is just giving you a general idea. So example, hog manure, somewhere around five to seven to one, very high nitrogen content. Anything below 30 to one is gonna be a high nitrogen source material. Uh, so you can see we've got several different types of manure in here, poultry manure, uh, vegetable waste, like I mentioned before, is a very high nitrogen source. Coffee grounds, tea grounds, very high nitrogen source. Fresh grass clippings, very high nitrogen. Horse manure, if you could get horse manure just by itself, you probably wouldn't need anything else to go with it. But uh, anybody out there that has horses know that you're never going to get just manure. You're going to have a lot of bedding put in there. Uh, now tree leaves, now we're starting to get into the more high carbon source materials. Uh, tree leaves. Corn stalks 60 to 1. So you can see we're getting much higher carbon amounts with these things. Straw around 100 to 1. Bark around 130 to 1. Paper 200 to 1. And then depending on whether you're talking about wood chips, sawdust, uh, those types of things, that can vary from 200 up to 700 to 1. In terms of particle size, uh, one of the big things that we want to look with that is porosity. Again, you got to have a small enough material that provides enough surface area for those bacteria to decompose. On the other hand, if you get it too small, it's going to make two things too. It's going to make things too dense. It's going to be very hard for air to flow through that pile, and that's going to shut things down. So you you, you need to have Again, it kind of a happy medium in there. And this is especially true if you're not going to turn that compost very often. 
Uh, in those cases, you probably want a little bit larger type of particles in there simply to provide some air space in there, some more oxygen availability for that bacteria. So what do we need in terms of particle size? Ideally, you want to look for particles around an eighth to a half inch in size. Again, that's small enough that the bacteria can work on, but not so small that it's going to cause compaction of that pile and not allow air to move through it. Moisture content is another very important aspect of, of good composting. You want that moisture content around 45 to 65 percent. And a good guide for that is just to go out and grab some of that material. And it should just feel very slightly damp. If you can wring water out of it, that is way too wet. And you don't want it crunchy. You don't want it super dry because, again, the bacteria need water to function. You don't want the, the pile completely saturated, though, because then that drives out all the air. So again, that 45 to 65% range is what you're looking for. That carbon nitrogen ratio around 30 to 1. And the pH, you're really not going to be checking that much for. But in most cases, most organic materials are going to be in that range. So we've talked about oxygen several different times. Now, how do you keep oxygen in the pile? Because what's going to happen is as those bacteria decompose that organic material, they're going to use up the oxygen. And so eventually, and this can happen actually just in the case of a few days, if you have very active compost taking place, how do you add more oxygen to it? Well, one of the ways that you can do that very easily is by periodic turning of that pile. So as you turn that pile, that's adding some of that atmospheric oxygen back into that pile, and that will allow the composting process to start up again. Now, uh, the next question is, well, how often should I turn it? Um, and I will tell you that commercial composting operations, when they first put their piles together, they'll be out there turning that, that compost, that windrow, every single day for probably the first five to seven days. I don't think anybody is going to do that for a backyard operation, and it probably really isn't necessary for you to do it that often. If you could do it once a week when you first mix the materials together for you know three or four weeks, that's great. But if you can't do that, at least turning it on a monthly basis is going to be better than nothing. Um, and if you need to go longer than that, that's fine. If you don't have odor issues and you're OK with the composting speed that's taking place, then, then that's up to you. OK, again, the periodic turning, uh, you want to make sure that the pile is not too wet because that can make things go anaerobic as well. With What I mean by that is lack of oxygen. Uh, so if you get a very heavy rainfall and you don't have that compost pile covered, uh, it's probably going to be way too wet. You're going to have to turn it simply to fluff it up to dry it out. If you're not going to be turning that compost very often, you may want to add some coarser or, in other words, larger particle sizes with it. Uh, wood chips might be an example. Now, those things are not going to decompose really fast, but it is going to add some airspace in there. And what you can do if you have a good, if you want a good finished product, you can build a little screen, screen out the good compost, take the uh, chips that are in the screen, put it back into the compost pile, let them continue to decompose. Some folks like to use ventilator stacks. Now, I've heard a few folks using these. Uh, it's basically just some plastic pipe with some holes drilled in it. You stick that into the compost pile, and that's supposed to help air flow through it. But one of the things that some researchers have found is that, yeah, it will allow airflow to come through there, but you're going to have preferential airflow. In other words, air is going to take the, the easiest path possible. So there, once they get to those pipes, that air pretty much goes on out, and then there may be pockets in there that are not getting oxygen. Temperature comes into play also. If it's below 90, that means something's not right. You don't have acting composting taking place. Now, if you have very good uh, materials in there and that those bacteria are having everything that they need to function, they will keep building up in numbers and you can get sometimes above 140. And getting on that side is not all that good either, because the higher you get above 140, a lot of those beneficial 
microorganisms, those beneficial bacteria that you would probably like to have when you add that compost to your soil are going to be killed out. And so you don't really want them to get above that either. By the time you get above 160, you're essentially sterilizing that compost. So all the beneficial benefits of those microorganisms are not going to be there anymore. So how do you track temperature? Well, one way you can do that is with a compost thermometer. Uh, if you don't have one of those, it's basically just a dial thermometer on about a three to four foot probe. And you want to stick the bottom of that probe, not in the very bottom of the compost pile, but towards the center bottom. Uh, maybe uh, you know three or four inches off the very bottom of it. That's where the highest temperatures should typically be. Cost of those things, depending on where you look and how long of a probe you get, can probably be anywhere from about forty to sixty dollars, depending on which website you look at. If you don't want to go that route uh, and you just kind of want a general idea of of temperature in there, get a piece of uh, metal uh, stake, uh, concrete rebar, or something like that. Just shove that into your compost pile, go out the next day, and just kind of feel on the outer end of that rod and see if you feel heat in that rod. Uh, if there is composting going on, you should feel some warmth in that metal. Again, moisture, you want to keep that compost at uh, a, a damp sponge feel. And that takes a little bit of management too because if it's in the middle of summer and you don't have a lot of uh, rainfall to, to moisten it naturally, you're probably going to have to go out there and put some water in it. Uh, on the other hand, if you have too much rainfall, it can make the compost way too wet and that causes problems as well. So you have to fluff it up, you have to turn it to dry it out. So how long does it take for compost to really be done. And I know that there are lots of people out there that say, oh, I have compost in one to two months. Well, I, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. Well, yeah, I kind of am, because if you want to talk about a good, high quality, finished compost, even with very active turning, like the commercial uh, composting operations do, about the minimum that you can hope for under ideal conditions is two months. And even at that, you're probably need, going to need to let it set for another one to two months if you're going to use it as a soil amendment. If you're just turning that compost pile, say, once a month or something like that, uh, you're probably looking at a year before you really get a good finished product. And even then, you're probably going to need to let it set again for a couple of months before you use it. If you just have a compost pile and you're just letting it sit out there and doing its, its own thing, you're looking at a couple of years. And even at that, the outside of that compost pile at two years, you're probably not going to see all that much difference with it. But it will have shrunk, and if you dig into that compost pile, you probably can get some finished compost um, out of the bottom of it if you dig into it a little bit. So what do we mean by curing compost? Well, what that's doing is, even though you get to the point where that compost looks done, it's got that earthy smell to it, it's got that crumbly feel to it, it doesn't look anything like what it originally started out as, it's probably not completely stable yet. And so if you added that directly into the soil and planted something in there right away, there still may be enough of a carbon nitrogen ratio difference that as those bacteria that are still going to be in the soil uh, try to finish that process of composting to get to that stable stage, they're going to pull nitrogen out of the soil to do that. And so if you plant directly into that soil where you added that immature compost, you're probably going to see plants that have a nitrogen deficiency. So that's why you let it cure out. Also, there may be a little bit of ammonia in that compost still. You're going to let that kind of... Uh, uh, vaporize and, and get driven off, um, and so that's why you want to let it cure for a little while. Um, I'm going to move on through that. Now, in terms of odor issues, uh, one of the first things that you should probably think about is, is there enough oxygen in that compost? Uh, it may be if you've had a lot of heavy rainfall, that compost may have gone anaerobic, if you have very, a lot of very fine material, very dense material, uh, that can cause 
the pile to go anaerobic as well. On rare occasions, if you have a lot of high nitrogen materials, like uh, you probably have maybe smelled a big pile of fresh grass clippings, uh, as once they've been piled up, sometimes they give off an ammonia smell. Uh, so those are, are some potential odor issues. Now, if you do not add bones, meats, fats, oils, dairy products to that compost pile, you really should not have a problem with your neighborhood raccoon, skunk, or dog getting into that compost. I guess on the other hand, if you really don't want to turn that compost pile yourself, you could stick a bone in there and then let your uh, uh, neighborhood rodents do the turning for you. But the problem with doing uh, putting meats, bones in there, uh, besides drawing critters, is that those also stop up airflow. And so it leads to that compost going anaerobic very quickly and leading to odor issues. All right, so let's get into the compost making part of things. And the first thing we're going to do is the simplest way of doing this. Doesn't require math. All you're going to do is layering with this. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to be mixing, layering several different types of feedstock, several different types of organic materials on top of each other. And what we're going to try to do is have these different organic materials average out to that 20 to 1 to 40 to 1 carbon nitrogen ratio range. Now you can start this out on bare ground. If some folks like to use wooden pallets, that hopefully helps a little bit with airflow in the compost. So what we're going to start out with is on the very bottom layer, six to eight inches of carbon rich material. So things like brown leaves uh, that you've raked up in the fall, straw, uh, dead garden material. Uh, so uh, think of the brown type of material, um, not on the manure side, but on the, the plant side. So about six to eight inches of those, that. On top of that, put a couple of inches of nitrogen-rich material. Things like coffee grounds, tea grounds, vegetable waste, fruit waste, manure, cow manure, horse manure, something like that. On top of that, put a couple of inches of garden soil, or if you already have some finished compost, add some of that. What you're doing there is adding the bacteria to get things going. Continue alternating those layers until you get up to that cubic yard size or until you run out of materials. And you can make it bigger than 3x3x3 three by three by three if you wish. Once you've done all that, go ahead and mix all of those materials together then and let things go. Now that was the, that was the really easy way to do it. Now we'll get into a little bit of math. But this next one really isn't all that difficult to look at or to think about. With this one, all we're doing is kind of doing it by parts. So we look at the carbon nitrogen ratios of some different feedstocks and um, we see what the what those average carbon nitrogen ratios are and we just add different parts, different amounts to that compost to get to an average of where we're, we're around that 30, 25 to 30 to 1 ratio. So for example, in this one here, we're mixing two parts of cow manure that have a carbon nitrogen ratio of 20 to 1. So that's one part at 20 to 1 and another part at 20 to 1 with a third part of dry leaves that have a ratio of 60 to 1. So if you add all three of those together, you've got a 20 to 1, another 20, and then a 60. You add all those up, you got 100. You divide them by the three parts, that gives you 33 to 1. So on the, on the carbon nitrogen ratio side, that's going to get you very close to where you want to be. Is that going to guarantee you're going to be right where you need to be in terms of um, moisture content uh, and those types of things? Not necessarily, but sometimes you just kind of have to work on one thing at a time. And again, we're not going to go through an exercise on, on this, but you can see some of these different things. Again, you can just kind of do this by parts 
uh, and you can go online. There's lots of different websites out there that have carbon nitrogen ratios, a lot of different extension websites that have uh, uh, information on the carbon nitrogen ratios of different feedstocks. So again, you can do this and it's, it's pretty simple math to do. And actually, we're not going to have you do a lot of your own calculations because uh, that could get uh, very, very uh, complex and it could cost millions of lives. So we're just not going to go there. What we're going to do instead is I'm going to show you a few uh, calculators that are available online that will do the math for you. Uh, one is from Cornell uh, and uh, shows the website there. Another one is from, and I always have trouble pronouncing it, Click, Clickitat County in Washington State. And then the Green Mountain one. Now this one, uh, it's kind of changed its website recently. And this one may not be as available as it used to be, but we're going to go ahead and at least show it just for reference. All right, now this one, you're going to have to get pretty close up to the screen to see this, but this is the one from Cornell. It's got it set up as a spreadsheet. And there's a number of different ingredients, if you're looking in that blue part of the screen, that you can choose from. And it will give you uh, information on what the expected moisture content would be, the percent nitrogen, the percent carbon, and um, then give you the results of that. So you can get pretty close, hopefully, by moving the amounts of ingredients around and, and what you're looking at to get, again, close to that right mix that you might need. And then if you did a search for basically Cornell compost, uh, that'll bring up the main site and then you should be able to, or even if you did Cornell compost uh, calculator, it should bring it right up for you. Um, I'm going to skip through that one because honestly, I, when I did this, I can't remember <laughs> where that one came from, whether that's another Cornell site. Uh, it could very well be. But we're going to skip through that one. This one for Click Attack County, I really like because it's it's very easy. Of different types of feedstocks, uh, up to four different types of feedstocks that you can add to this, and uh, then you can talk about how many cubic feet of this material that you're adding. Which again, varying amounts. We're going kind of back to those how many parts of of some material you have. Uh, so you can vary that around to see if that will get you into that right carbon-nitrogen ratio that you're looking for. And again, this one I've just put, a, put in some vegetable waste, coffee grounds, and compacted wet leaves. And I basically put in one part for the vegetable waste, one part for the coffee grounds, and four parts for the compacted leaves. And uh, that gets us to a, a carbon-nitrogen ratio of 25.8 or 28.5 to 1. So, um, you know, in terms of the carbon nitrogen ratio, it's right on the mark. Is that going to be, again, where we need to be in terms of moisture content and those kind of things? You may have to look at it when it's together and, and uh, make some changes at that point in terms of, of moisture. Uh, now, this is one from uh, Green Mountain Tech. As you can see, the screen thing here says uh, receive a free copy of our compost calculator with the purchase of our dial temperature probes. Um, so that used to be a, a free service, but it, uh, now this is on the commercial side of things. Maybe they, it's still available on the individual side. But what this has is set up kind of as a, a dial, and it has differences for density, moisture, and carbon-nitrogen ratio. And so in that dial, uh, if one, something, one of these three is right where it needs to be, it's going to be in that green range. If you're a little bit outside of it, it's going to be in the yellow. And if it's in an area that really is too far off the mark, it's going to be in the red. Again, lots of different types of ingredients that you can choose from that's already on the site that you can, can pick from. And here I've just gone through an example with this uh, of using uh, cardboard, corn stalks, food waste, and tree trimmings. And you can see for the density, it's a little bit denser than what we need uh, for airflow. So we probably would have to maybe back off some of these things or add something with a little bit more porosity to get that into the green range. For the moisture content, a little bit high on the moisture content. 
Uh, and then on the carbon nitrogen ratio, this is down to 18 to 1. So again, we probably would need to vary this a little bit to get closer to that ideal range that we'd want to get to. But at least this gives you an idea of how these calculators work. So again, fairly straightforward, pretty easy to use. You don't have to go through and, and develop your own computer programs to do these things. That'll do the math for you. Now some of these things now I've got, uh, and when I did this the other day, somebody, some folks pointed out that uh, at least one of these things is uh, not correct. Uh, and I would agree with them. Uh, where it's talking about um, cattle manure, cattle manure is not going to weigh 140 pounds per cubic foot. That should be 40 pounds per cubic foot. Because it's not going to weigh more than water. If you have a foot of cubic water, that weighs about 62 pounds. So cattle manure, although it can be dense, it's not going to weigh 140 pounds per cubic foot. So uh, leaves, not very dense at all. So a cubic foot of those, uh, and even that, um, you know, th these weights are probably a little bit on the high side. All right, uh, so that, that kind of goes through the basics of uh, what I wanted to cover. Uh, if you do have other information or that you'd like to have on composting, feel free to contact me. There's my contact information. My email address is friend at illinois.edu, so you're welcome to send me an email, and uh, I'll try to help you out as best I can. Uh, if there are other recordings from the Four Seasons uh, series that you'd like to see, those are available on YouTube. And so if you have friends or relatives that wanted to see this one, they can go on to YouTube and, and actually uh, watch it there. And there's the address for that. It's go.illinois.edu backslash Four Seasons Recordings. And this is the part where I'll stop. And if anybody has a question, again, you can go ahead and unmute your mic or you can just type it in the chat box and uh, I'll see if I can answer it. So we'll give you a second to, uh, to do that. Hello? Hi. Go Hi. ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Yes, I'd like to ask, uh, what could cause maggots to be in your compost bin? I maggots? Maggots? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, you well, can have you can fruit. Have fruit. I'm getting a lot of I'm feedback, so. I'm muted back. So, <laughs> uh, um, so uh, that could be from, you know, if you've got a lot of fresh fruit or vegetable waste in there. Uh, now, really, if, if you're getting active composting, there probably shouldn't be uh, those types of critters in there because those temperatures are going to kill all those things out. So if you're seeing something like that, uh, you're probably not having a lot of active composting taking place. But the other thing would be, you know, if you've got a lot of fresh fruit waste in there, uh, you might want to try pick, mixing that together a little bit more and uh, seeing if that takes care of the problem. And if you can kind of monitor the temperature a little bit, see if you are getting some active composting going, um, you know, that, that would be my, my suggestion. All right, another question. Yeah. Is uh, where's the where's the where's the best where's place the best to start place? a comp? <laughs> I'm getting a bit, a lot of feedback again. Okay, thanks. Uh, where's the best place to start a compost pile? Really, you can start it anywhere you want, but some some things that you want to stay away from. If you're not going to want to water that compost uh, a lot during the summer, you want to keep it out of a full sun location. You want to keep it away from a windy location. If you're going to have just a pile of compost out there, that's fine, but do not put it right next to a large tree and just let it sit there for a year or two. Uh, you can do that, but what you're going to find is once you start to go in and try to pull some of that compost out, that large tree has also discovered that that compost provides a great snack, and so roots are going to be growing into that compost pile. So I would keep them away from large trees as well. Um, now some folks will go ahead and cover their compost pile, uh, and, and that's that's great if you're going to manage the uh, material for it. You also don't want it in a low-lying location where you can have a lot of water runoff from rain events. So otherwise, it's kind of where you feel best uh, suited to do that. Now, some municipalities do have setbacks on where you can put your compost. 
from the neighbor's property. So if you're in a municipality, you probably want to check on city ordinances. Okay, another question. Is the best compost at the bottom of the pile? Well, probably the closest to being finished is going to be at the bottom. Again, if you have a very passive pile where you haven't turned it very often, where you're going to find that material that's earthy, crumbly, is going to be at the bottom. And, um, you know, that's going to be your, your best, uh, best compost in terms of it being finished. So, yeah, at the bottom is where you're going to find most of that. Now, if you're actively turning it, the whole pile would be fine. Uh, one other thing while another person is typing a, a question. Um, one of the ways to test to see if that compost is done is do a simple germination test. You know, get um, like nine small plastic containers, uh, fill three up with compost, fill three up with garden soil, and then the other three do a combination of compost and soil. And then put in some uh, seeds that germinate fairly quickly and easily like radish seeds and make sure you got them all all the containers labeled so you know which one's compost which one's soil and which one's the mixture and then let them grow and see how well they do if those ones that are in just a compost mix those seedlings don't do well uh, or if they they germinate but then they die out you know that that compost is not finished you can go a, a more expensive route there is something called the solvita test where you put some of the compost into this jar, you close it up for about four hours, and there's little test strips in there. And if it's got too much ammonia in it, it will give a certain give a certain color. Uh, if there's too much carbon dioxide giving off, it'll give a certain color, which either one of those tells you that that compost is immature. I don't think most backyard composters are going to want to pay for that, but that's a, a more accurate way of doing it as well. Can you use the compost? Uh, yeah, again, if, if you want to do that germination test, uh, just to make sure. Now, if you're just going to use it as a mulch, yeah, that's fine. Uh, the big, big um, concern would be is if you're going to put that into the soil and then plant something directly into it. Now, at this time of year, if you want to go ahead and put it in the soil and you're not really sure, by next spring, it should be fine. So uh, that's only if you have some compost, say, in the, in the spring, you're going to use it as a soil amendment and then plant your spring garden right into it. That's when you really need to be concerned about whether that compost is done. All right, I'm not hearing or seeing any other questions. Oh, wait a minute, we got one here. Uh, we saw urine listed on the Cornell calculator. Is this something that you recommend? Not really. Now, you're going to get some of that, you know, if, if you're using, um, you know, uh, bedding from horses or um, uh, cows or, you know, those types of, of animals, yeah, you're going to have some of that into it. Now, uh, yeah, I'm definitely not talking about human urine or anything like that, yeah, but you are going to have some urine in the bedding, and it's going to be a very high nitrogen content material. Okay, we had another question. Looks like it's coming. And while that is being typed, I'm going to grab a quick drink here. So go ahead and keep typing. Okay, um, if you're unsure if the compost is good, should I use it on flowers rather than vegetables? Really depends on how uh, how in love you are with those flowers, I guess. Um, you know, if you're not really sure and you got some flowers that uh, maybe you're not wanting to take care of that much, uh, yeah, go ahead and try it. And if they don't do well, then you know that that compost is not done. Um, so yeah, that, I guess that would be one way of testing it. Again, uh, you know, if you're if you're really unsure, it's pretty easy to do that germination test. Some really good questions here.
Okay, I think that that must be it for the question. So again, if you have any other questions at other times, feel free to email me or give me a call. And um, with that, I'm going to uh, to sign off. Hopefully everybody got something out of this uh, that they found worthwhile. And uh, everyone have a good evening.